But that's the title of my sermon today. The title of my sermon is Are Ye Able? And it comes from the passage in Matthew 20. And we'll read through that. So Are Ye Able? This sermon is really trying to challenge you to not just uh, desire to be at a certain spiritual level or desire certain success in different areas of your life, but to actually think, you know, you actually have to do something to reach that level. Right? There, there's actually something, you know, it's easy to want to, to excel, right? It's easy to want to be better at something or to be at a certain position, but to actually do, to, you know, are you able to actually do what it takes to get there in your Christian life in different areas, whether it's work, family, or you think about the different kingdoms that exist. I don't know if that's the right word, but, uh, you know, in your family, in church and at work, um, and our government's obviously one as well, but, you know, unless you work in government, that's a, that's a different story. But are you able to get to that level that you desire? So I'm taking this thought, this is the thought I have when I read Matthew 20, and I think of this story when the sons of Zebedee, uh, and the mother as well, actually, there's two different times, and we're going to look at these two passages, where they come to Jesus and actually ask, you know, James and John actually ask to be the ones sitting on Jesus' right and left hand uh, when, uh, in, the, uh, when, when in, in um, the, the new heaven, new earth. So it says here in Matthew 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So in Matthew 20, it's actually James and John's mother coming to Jesus. So in, in Mark 10, when we read a bit later, we'll see it's actually James and John coming to Jesus. So I believe it is the same event. I don't think these are different events. Uh, I haven't looked at it that closely, but I believe it's the same event. And the reason why it's just two, because they're coming to him as a group. It's kind of like in, in, uh, in the Gospels where Peter denies the Lord three times and there's different mentions of different people. And sometimes it's one person in the group, sometimes it's a group. So it, it accounts the story differently. But I think when we read and the whole, to both the accounts together, we see that it's actually the group approaching him. And that's why he actually speaks to them in the plural a bit later, even though in this account he's um, answering her directly. So Matthew 20, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? So it's that what wilt means, what, what, do, you, what do you want? You know, in, in that sense. She saith unto him, grant or give that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. So it's interesting that it's not just the men wanting to exalt themselves. But it's also the mom that wants to exalt her children, right? I guess moms want to, to, to have their children be proud of their children, right? Be pleased with their children. And even she hoping that her children are exalted above the other uh, 10 apostles. But Jesus answered and said, and this is where I get the title of my sermon, uh, ye, know, ye know not what ye ask. Why? Because they are desiring a certain position. They're desiring a certain spiritual success. But what he's getting at is, do you actually understand or do you realize what it actually takes to be at the right and left hand of Jesus? What that actually entails? And he, and he knows their thought. He knows what they, that they know and that they don't know. He's telling them, you don't know actually what you are asking. And sometimes we don't always know what we ask. Have you ever thought when you pray the prayer, you know, make me more like Jesus Christ? You ever really thought about what that actually means? You know, like we pray, I want to be more Christ-like. I want to be more like Jesus Christ. And sometimes we need to be reminded what that actually means. You know, Jesus Christ, he had to humble himself. You know, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We read about the suffering. And this is really what he's talking about here. You know, so when we pray something like, make me more like Jesus, you know, do we, do we understand what we're actually asking for? You know, and God has grace on us. You know, he, he has grace that he doesn't, you know, make us in that, in that instant like Jesus. You know, he, he's, he's a bit, he's, a bit uh, he's, uh, he's slow with us. He's patient with us and he molds us slowly because if he actually gave us sometimes what we ask, we wouldn't be able to handle it. Uh, so he says here, are ye able? So are you able to drink of that cup, of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They say unto him, we are able. Now, I don't know if that's just them in their naivety saying, hey, we're able to go through these things and they don't yet know what they are going through. 
But Jesus answers and says to them, He saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation, so like hatred, against the two brethren, you know, thinking that they wanted to be exalted above the rest of the twelve. And then Jesus goes into, hey, you know, it's the greatest among you is going to be servant of all. Um, you know, saying, hey, you, you, you're going, you want to be the greatest and you need to be a servant. You want to be exalted to my right and left hand. Do you understand what it actually takes? You have to drink of the cup and be baptized of the baptism that I'm baptized with. And he's saying, hey, they are going to taste that because the 12 apostles are exalted. Uh, besides Judas, obviously, he was replaced by Matthias. And they went through a lot of suffering. Um, so I'll show you that in a moment, because that is what the cup that's being talked about, is the suffering that, that Jesus goes through. But look here in Mark 10, when we see the parallel passage of the sons of Zebedee, right? James and John, they're also known as uh, uh, the sons of thunder. James and John, so this is them now going to Jesus uh, in Mark 10. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came, come unto him. So Zebedee is their father, if you didn't know. So the mother of Zebedee is obviously Zebedee's wife. And Zebedee is the name of their, of their father. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him saying, Master, and, and just, just when I read this, I just think, wow, what? I'm just, a, I'm just sort of shocked at the attitude that they have to Jesus. But often we have this same attitude. When you read it, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And, and think about this. You read that and you think, whoa, like what sort of person does it take to go to God in the flesh and go, hey, I want you to do what I want you to do. Right? I mean, that's pretty much what they're saying. And you think about that sort of attitude. But often as Christians, we have that attitude. We have that attitude where we just think God is just going to do whatever we want. You know, we get down on our knees. We don't think about what God is like. You know, and we just expect God to answer our prayers just because we prayed them. Right? We just expect God to do it. You know, when we need help, now we pick up the prayer phone and, and speak to God. But you know, what, we need to think about the attitude in which we come to God. Now, Jesus obviously is, has grace that even though people come to him with the wrong attitude, he, he can correct them lightly. He still has grace there. But we need to think we ought not to have this sort of attitude where we just expect God to do whatever we want. And sometimes what you want is, is valid. You know, I'm not saying what we ask for is not reasonable. Even if it's, you know, persecution or financial issues or health issues, obviously we come to God for help. We need to think about the attitude we come to him in. You know, he's not just there. He's not our servant. You know, we, God is not there to serve us. You know, we're here to serve God. But also... Do we go to him just expecting him to answer everything? And you say, yeah, well, you know, if God loved me, why wouldn't he answer my prayer? Why wouldn't he help me with this sickness? And often, you know, that's, that's a, it's a hard pill to swallow that. Yeah, you know, we, we sometimes think, you know, if God loves us, why is he helping us with these things? But when we look at examples in the Bible, you know, what about John the Baptist? Have you ever reflected on the life of John the Baptist? Sometimes when you think about the life of John the Baptist, you just, it just blows your mind. And, and it really puts things in perspective into to where you sit in the hierarchy of Christianity, right? Because John the Baptist, Jesus said himself, was the greatest man born among women. And think about his end, right? He was rotting in a jail cell and ultimately just beheaded. You know, he, he started this great ministry, right? He's the vo voice of one crying in the wilderness, preaching to thousands, getting thousands converted, getting thousands baptized, and then... At the end of his life, he's just writing a prison while Jesus is on this earth. Now, don't you think that John in prison is probably thinking, God, deliver me from prison. Help me. Like, why am I, why am I in here? You know, help me get out of here. And even while Jesus is walking on this earth, he's here, he leaves John the Baptist in prison. Right? That, that's, a, that's a sobering thought. When you think, you, you know, we deserve God to just come at our beck and call to answer our prayers, when the greatest man born among women, the greatest prophet, um, besides Jesus Christ, of course, that lived, was left to die in prison. You know, but you know, he was humbled to that point, and surely in heaven he's going to be exalted. So 
It just, it's just a sobering thought when you think about John the Baptist and um, you know, what, what, what sort of attitude we should come to God with and what we should expect of God. I mean, we should just be grateful that we even have life let alone have God answering our prayers, let alone being able, if you think about being able to, you know, you know, in, in the privacy of your room, you know, close your, however you pray, you get on your knees, you close your eyes and have a direct line to the God of the universe. You know, you don't even have that in, in a business. You know, how many people, how many people where you work, you know, none of us can just pick up the phone and talk to the prime minister. None of us can just pick up the phone and just, you know, get the CEO of the company you work for just to, to, to listen to your requests. But yet God, of the, God in heaven, you have that line through Jesus Christ. You know, that's, that's an amazing thought. So we ought not have this sort of attitude when we approach God. You know, we, we need to understand who we're talking to and who we're requesting things of and have the right perspective on expectations when when we ask god for prayer you know where we are uh, are blessed to even be alive let alone have the god of the universe hear us and answer our prayers so they come to him they said unto him grant us that we may sit one on the right thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory but jesus said unto them ye know not what ye ask can ye drink of the cup that i drink of and be baptized with the baptism that i am baptized with and they said unto him we can and Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. So that's the parallel passage there. So the thought I really want to drive from this is, you know, we sometimes desire to, to be something or to do or to be somewhere, some spiritual level or some success in our life. But the question is, I, do you understand what it actually takes to get there? What you actually have to do to get there? Because it's easy to de desire something. It's easy to want something, but it's hard to actually do what is required to get there. Now, in this specific in instance, what was required to be exalted to that level was to take part in the suffering of Jesus Christ. And I think we see this throughout the Bible, and that's what this cup is referring to. So obviously there are different, you know, the, the, the analogy of a cup can be used different ways in the Bible. But what I believe Jesus is talking about here is the cup of suffering that he was going to go through. And when we look at Matthew 26, when he's actually uh, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, he actually refers to this cup of suffering that he's going to have to drink. Now, I'm starting from verse uh, 31, because I just wanted to show you something interesting where you know, we, we read in uh, Matthew 20 and Mark 10, the story of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, right? And here is where uh, Jesus actually speaks to Peter, saying, hey, you're going to deny me three times. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock uh, shall be scattered. So I just underlined smite because um, you can see from, from verse 32 that he's not just being beaten, he's actually going to be killed, right? Because he says, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So he's telling his disciples that he's about to die, uh, and, but he will rise again. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. So we're on the topic of people saying things and not really knowing what they're asking for or what they're saying. Peter's the same, right? Because Peter's saying, hey, I'm going to die with you. I'll never be offended. But he didn't really realize what he's gonna, about to go through. Right? So he's speaking a bit quickly here. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me, thrice. So Jesus shuts him down pretty quickly saying, hey, you know, you're quite confident in dying with me and not being offended, but before tonight, you're going to deny me three times. And we know uh, when, we, when we looked at the Gospels that Peter actually denied him more than three times. So he didn't say that he would only deny him three times. He just said that he would deny him three times uh, because in, when, you go, when you compare the Gospels, uh, Peter actually denied him more than three times, but he just denied him at least three times before the cock, the first cock crowed. Look at this, verse 35. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And I don't know if you realize that the gospel said this, but it says here in verse 35, Likewise also said all the disciples. 
So you see that it wasn't just Peter saying, hey, I'm going to die with you. I'll never be offended because of you. He was maybe the first one that said it. You know, he's sort of leading each other, sort of, you know, flexing his muscles. But all the other stuff is, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we'll stay with you as well. So all of them actually uh, said that. But we know in the Gospels, they all, when, when Jesus was arrested, they all forsook him and fled. So it wasn't just Peter, although Peter was the most uh, uh, vo uh, vocal about it. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place. So this is after they've all said, hey, we'll never be offended because of you. But I want you to note that this Peter, and then we looked at James and John. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. So this is where he's going to the garden to now pray uh, to the Father. And saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Look at this. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So isn't it interesting that in the garden you have Peter, you know, sort of going off with his mouth saying he's going to do all this stuff. You have the sons of Zebedee say, hey, yeah, we can do, we drink that cup and, and be baptized with the baptism. So now Jesus gives them a little bit of a test, right? He takes Peter and the sons of Zebedee and says, hey, we're not going to do any suffering. You know, I'm going to die. You just have to pray with me for one hour. You know, just watch for one hour, right? And began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So we start to see now the humanity of Jesus Christ, you know, coming out where he's actually, you know, sorrowful and, he, and, he's, and, he's, and he's not looking forward to what he has to go through. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, and here we go, let this cup, Pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So you remember when he talked about the cup that he had to drink and the baptism that he had to be baptized of? What is he referring to? He's referring to the suffering and the shame that he's about to go through. And that's part of what we also take part in as a Christian, that we also suffer for his name, for those that live righteously. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, see, that's different, a different attitude, right, to the sons of Zebedee. Because remember, the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and they're like, hey, we want you to do what we want. But Jesus, now he's praying in the garden. He's saying, not my will, but thine be done. And that's the attitude we ought to have in anything we ask of God. And that's often why you'll hear me pray for things. But ultimately, we want God's will to be done. And sometimes God is more glorified when he doesn't give us what, he, what we want, you know? And often a, a good example of this that I, that I learned from Pastor Rick, uh, and obviously this is just interpretation of different passages, but when uh, an, uh, Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah and God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he actually petitioned God to, hey, you know, you're gonna destroy the righteous with the wicked. And he sort of bargains down with God to 10 people and then God eventually takes Lot out because of um, Abraham's uh, request, uh, rather than just destroying Lot with the city, right? Because we don't know what, what God would have done, but maybe God would have just destroyed the, the city with Lot. But when Lot came out, you know, remember how he slept with his daughters, his daughters got him drunk, and then was born the, uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites, which were enemies of Israel, it caused a lot of problems. And uh, the, 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 the way it was preached, and I just thought it was really interesting that God actually gave Abraham what he asked for but it might not have actually been the best thing to do because the enemies of Israel came out from it so anyways just just a thought there but I just thought it was interesting that sometimes we ask things of God and it's not always the best thing and sometimes it's better when God actually doesn't answer our prayers because we we don't actually know everything that's going on but God does so that's why we just have to trust that God answers things according to his time and sometimes he doesn't because it's better for us and we just don't see the full picture so he then saith he unto him, my soul, uh, nevertheless not, uh, as, uh, that'll be done. Verse 40, and he cometh unto, his, unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what could ye not watch with me one hour? Now, that, I mean, obviously there's a lot going on and, and then maybe they're tired, but, you know, we can obviously have some grace on these people. But the point here, I think, is Jesus is showing them, hey, you were willing to die for me. You were willing to, you know, go drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism. And you can't even pray and watch for one hour. And I mean, one hour is quite reasonable. I mean, if you've ever gone to a prayer meeting and prayed, like one hour can pass pretty quickly when people are praying. Um, 
But these people that, uh, you know, Peter, James and John, they were not able to even watch one hour with Jesus, even though they talked themselves up a lot. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. So you see there the cup is referring to the suffering that he's about to go through. Matthew 26, verse 43. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, if you didn't know what lo meant, lo is a, sh a short way of saying look, right? So if you see, in, if you read in the Bible, lo and behold, what does it mean? It means look, and behold means look as well, right? So it's just a way, you know, I guess Shakespearean language of how to say look. So behold, he's at hand, lo, Ju Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. So this is where uh, Jesus then is uh, carried away and, and taken off to trial and whatnot. So we get a, a bit of a, a glimpse into the suffering that they actually experienced because Paul talks about the suffering that he experienced as an apostle. And this is the, the cup that I think James and John were not realizing that they were actually to, wanting to, requesting to partake in. So he, they did go through it. But Jesus was just telling them, hey, you don't actually understand the extent of what you're asking here. 2 Corinthians 1, Paul writes here, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So he's saying, hey, we're comforted in tribulation because they're going through persecution and hard times. And at the same time, God is comforting them through it. So God doesn't always comfort you by removing trials and tribulations. He comforts you as you go through trials and tribulations. For as the sufferings, look at this, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. So you see here how the apostles are partaking of the sufferings of Christ, as we also do as well. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so, they, they, so they're not just suffering a little, they're suffering a lot, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And that's something to always to remember when you're going through hard times. Oftentimes you are going through those hard times so that you can be a comfort to other people. Right? When you go through hard times, you then are able to comfort others that go through those hard times. Right? Like if you suffer from any sort of illness, you know, illness is probably the most common. People have illness and they're beseeching for God to remove it from them, but then they meet somebody else who's suffering the same illness. Right? And they're able to comfort that person because they themselves have been comforted of God. And he's saying here in verse 5, as your sufferings of Christ abound, so the more you suffer, the more you can console people, right? So our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Now, the primary application here is obviously physical persecution. These people are being beaten and in danger of their lives. But as they go through that, they learn to trust in God. And as other people may be fearful, they're able to console them and say, hey, God can bring us through this. God will comfort us through this. But we can take that application to other first world areas right so you know we we all have got it easy here and that's why you know the more we're given the more that's required of us you know we're here we're prosperous we have freedoms that other places don't enjoy you have a lot of time and efficiencies you know you don't spend your time walking down to the river collecting water you know walking down to the river to do your washing and all that sort of stuff you know we have we have technology that gives us more time so what are you doing with that time, right? We're more efficient now. Are you just wasting that time on leisure for yourself, doing things for yourself? Or do you think, hey, I now have technology that allows me to have more time. I'm going to use that extra time to serve God. I'm going to make sure soul winning's on my schedule. I'm going to make sure I'm at church, right? That once a week. 
Make sure I go to church. I can do things other times, right? Because my life is efficient now. I can, I can get that time back if I need to and make sure I'm investing more time for God. So your suffering abounds, your consolation is going to abound. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. Right? So Paul doesn't want you to not know what they're going through so that you're ready if it happens to you. Which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much, look at this, that we despaired even of life. So we talked about the cup of suffering that the apostles were going to go through. And look at how he's describing it here. Pressed out of measure, so above that you can even contain, above strength that you can even handle, in so much that we despaired even of life. We didn't even know whether we were going to survive it. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. So you see how he's saying here, this is how they comforted themselves, that their life, they got to the point where their life wasn't even in their own hands anymore. They had nothing else but to trust God, right? Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And that's often something you learn in your Christian life and people have go through and, uh, you know, where sometimes, you know, people don't look up until God brings them down. You know, until you're brought down to your knees, that's, that's when you're willing to look up. So sometimes God has to humble us in that way so that we'll trust him. 2 Corinthians 1.6 and, and whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. So Paul is saying, you know, it's great if I know that you're going to suffer like we suffer, then I know you're going to be comforted like I'm comforted. Right, because he's experienced that's what he's saying there so second corinthians 11 this is another passage where paul talks about the things that he goes through as a follower of jesus christ and that, and we reflect on when we ask to be more like jesus christ do we know what we are asking are they ministers of christ i speak as a fool i am more in labors more abundant in stripes above measure so he's been you know stripes more than he can count in prisons more frequent in deaths off i don't even know how you how, how are you in deaths off you know i think you, I, I, I don't know how that makes sense maybe one of you guys can explain it to me of the jews five times received i 40 stripes save one so he's recounting these moments but he's saying here in verse 23 that he's actually been whipped more than he can count but of the jews there were five times where he received 40 stripes save one so 39 times thrice was i beaten with rods once was I stoned. So that's what people believe, you know, 2 Corinthians 12 is talking about where he was caught up to the third heaven, that he was actually stoned, he died and actually was brought back to life. Thrice I suffered sh shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. So for the cause of Christ, Paul has actually been in the, in the ocean overnight, just like waiting, you know, to be saved. I'm sure that's not very pleasant at all. In journeyings often, in perils of waters. So perils is danger. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. So it's like no matter where he goes, there, there's danger serving Christ. In perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, so watchings is, I guess, uh, you know, staying up at night just to, to, to keep yourself safe. In hunger and thirst, not having food or water. In fastings often, in cold and nakedness, not having shelter. And look at this, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So Paul's saying he's going through all this hard times. And not only that stuff outside of the church, he's also got to look after people within the church as well. So this is a bit of a glimpse into the life of an apostle. And, you know, the thought I have is sometimes we'll think, uh, you know, sometimes we'll have the thought, you know, I wish, I wish like I lived at the time of Jesus. You know, yeah, sometimes you'll think that, like I, I wish like I saw Jesus and I could follow Jesus at that time. You know, like, oh, you know, I, you know, I, you know it'd be great. I'm sure, it is, I'm sure it's great to be an apostle, right? And then you actually read the things that they go through and then you realize, 
like Jesus said, you know not what you ask. <laughs> you know, are you able to drink of the same cup and be baptized of the same baptism? Uh, you know, do we really understand what, we, what we're saying when we say, oh, you know, I wish we had saw Jesus and followed him because I'm sure that life was not as easy as you have it now. So let's just go through a couple of quick, you know, applications to our, our life today. But really the main point, I know I talked a bit about suffering, talking about asking for things. It's easy to want and not to do. So just some quick applications just in church and family and work where, you know, you may desire something. You may desire to be at a certain stage. You know, they wanted to sit at the right hand, left hand of God. And Jesus says, you know, are you able to actually do what it takes to get there? And sometimes I think about it in our, just our church life, you know, some applications. You know, in our soul winning, people will say, you know, I, 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 I wish I was better at soul winning. You know, I wish, you know, I could see somebody get saved. You know, it's, it's really easy to want these things, really easy to desire these things, but are you able to actually do what it takes to get there, right? Like, you may go soul winning with me and think, oh, you know, Victor, you know, he, he, he gives the plan, it's like he gives the plan of salvation so easy. He knows what verses to go to, and he knows, you know, what answers to give and things like that. And I'm not trying to talk myself up here, but I'm just saying, you know, but are you able to, to do the things that I've done in order to get to that point? You know, it's not just that I wanted it one day and then the next day I was there and you see me giving the gospel and it's really easy. No, no, it's been years and years of trial and error, you know, making a fool of yourself at the door, think, you, know, you know, being stumped at times and then thinking, well, how am I going to respond to this later? You know, hours and hours of reading up different answers and, come, you, know, you know, wrestling over different scriptures so that next time that comes up, hey, I know how to answer this. You know, how much time, you know, you want to see somebody get saved? How many times are you actually going soul winning? Right, if you go soul winning once every two months, I mean, you're only going soul winning six times a year. You know, it's not, that, it's not really that many times that you go. And if you go for like an hour, because sometimes people, when they go soul winning, they're always like waiting for when they need to go, right? And so I, I don't like soul winning that's only one hour. Or soul winning that's one hour. You can't, you, there's, there's not no time at all. Because when you go soul winning for one hour, I mean, you're trying to get into a conversation for half an hour, and then the next half an hour, it's like you're worried that if you get into a conversation, you're going to go over your time. So that's why I always like to go soul winning a minimum of two hours because then at least you're, you're going door knocking for at least an hour, right? And then if, even if you get into a conversation at the end of the hour, you have an whole hour to get through that conversation, right? So how much time do you actually spend going soul winning? How much time have you spent learning, you know, looking up these things? You know, how much time have you spent trying to improve? You know, if you want your soul winning to improve, you want, you want to see people get saved. I mean, how much time are you actually investing thinking about these things and investing time learning about the doctrines, learning how to answer, getting better at responding, being prepared? You know, like when you go to the door, you think, well, I'm just going to go there and wing it. I don't. I didn't do that when I started soul winning. No, like when I go to the door, I, I, I you know, like I, I teach about having this script. I mean, that has chopped and changed and, you know, because I'm always trying to improve it. Like, how can I make this introduction be a bit more natural? How can I transition into giving the gospel? What are the questions to ask? Where have I, you know, if, I, if I've done something and it's been effective, I'm thinking like, okay, I'm going to use that next time when I talk to them and use that, make sure I drive that point to help them to understand. So it's a constant tweaking process. So if you want your soul winning to improve, hey, yeah, it's easy to desire that, but what are you actually doing about it? You know, are you able to actually do what it takes to improve your soul winning, to improve your Bible knowledge? I mean, this is sort of interlinked. You know, sometimes you'll hear preaching or you'll hear people talking about the Bible. And, you know, I, I've had people uh, say things before. I've heard people comment before where they're like, they feel left out in a group because, you know, everyone's talking about Bible doctrine and, you know, they wish they could be part of that group and, or, you know, talking about it as well. Or, you know, you'll listen to preaching or hear people talking about the Bible and they're like, oh, how do you, how do you know all this stuff? Well, it's, you just have to read the Bible. You know, it's, just, those are, it's, not, it's nothing magical, guys. It's like even the stuff I'm teaching tonight, things I know. It's not that I have some special revelation. It's just that I've studied the Bible longer. And there are people that know the Bible more than I do. And I think, well, how did you know that? But then I know it's because they read it. You know, they studied it out. They put in the work to read it, to compare scripture with scripture. They meditated on it. They thought about it. So it's easy to just say, hey, I want to have that. No, I want, well, are you able to actually do the work to put in the effort to get to that stage. 
Uh, what's another thing I've got here on church is, is, is friendships. You know, some people are not happy with the sort of friendships they have at church. And they say, well, nobody likes me. I don't have very good friends at church. They, they want to hire, you know, a, a better, better friendships, better relationships with people at church. Well, it's easy to want that, right? It's easy to desire that. But what are you doing? Are you able to be friendly you know, have, have some people over. Do you know? But you say hello to those those people. You make some friends. So it's easy to want more friends. But are you able to do what it takes to make more friends, right? Uh, so so relationships. You know, are you are you being a friend? You know, are you are you opening yourself up to allow yourself to even make friends? You know, often people, uh, you maybe they're burnt in the past, or maybe it's just laziness. Sometimes me is just laziness. You know, it's just, it's just laziness to be like, ah, oh, it's like, it's a lot of work to make a friend, right? And, and you know, to, to go, so sometimes you just, you know, you're not as deep, but I found, the, the, I guess the way I make friends is I'm just very transparent, right? Because I think that I feel like that's what you have to risk to make a friend. You know, it's like in any relationship, you have to sort of let your guard down. You need to open up a bit. You need to risk being hurt. You need to risk being made a fool. Isn't that sometimes why you don't say hello to people at work or out and about? Because you don't want to be rejected or you don't want to be like try and put yourself in a group and then they sort of don't want you there. <laughs> Let's close the group. So that, that's, that's what stops us from making friends. It's the same at church. That's what stops you from making more friends. You know, if, but if you open up, you know, and you come across the people that, you know, that, you know, you open up then they open up, then that's when a friendship starts and you can start to get to know one another. And it's multifaceted. It's not just that. Obviously, it's serving together and other things. And that's why I'm th I've been thinking a lot about, you know, we, we, I think we should have a church camp one day. I'd like to organize one day. Because I, I was thinking about this uh, over in Perth and just how to, to gel groups together. But where, where I see a, a family camp as a church is really good is because when you, when you come to church just to see each other, you know, you're, kind of, you're dressed up, you kind of know you're only going to see each other for a couple of hours, and you're, all, you're sort of on your best behavior, and then you just see each other every week. But you know, what a, you know what a camp does? And this is what I've realized throughout these years, is because when you go to a camp, you can't get away from everyone. You know, you're there, you're living together, you're, there, you're spending a few days together, you see each other in your pajamas, you see each other without your makeup. And, and, and to me, it kind of forces that humbling. And that's where people can now just be real with one another. You know, whereas, whereas when you see each other every Sunday, you can get away with not being real with one another. You know, even, even having people over for dinner, you can get away with not being, because you're just having them over for a few hours. But that's what I think about, about a camp, when you actually live together, it's you, your real self must come, it will come out <laughs> eventually. And that's, I think, what gels groups together. So it is something that's on my radar that I want to do. And I've tried to do it, I've tried to do it in the past, but then people don't come. I like organize camp and then nobody comes. It's always been like Philippa and our family. That's, that's been the church camp. And this is when Philippa wasn't even going to our church. So she was like coming to our church camp and she's like not even part of our church back then. <laughs> So next time we organize one, we've got to get some families committed to it and we all go together. I think it'll be really fun. Uh, okay, so friendships. Uh, ordination. I know some of you guys here have a desire to be a bishop one day. So, you know, it's easy to have that desire, right? Even when you go to those youth camps and they, they, they make all these teenagers make a, make a, make a decision to be a preach, full-time preacher one day. That never made sense. Why would you make a 12, 13, 14-year-old boy walk the aisle and say one day he's going to be a preacher. He's not even married yet. He doesn't even have kids yet. It's a textbook example of you have no idea what it even takes to, to be a bishop, to, to run a family, and he's going to, you're going to make him make a decision, you know, to, to be a, a preacher one day. And, and he, he's not even finished high school. You know, he's not even finished his education. So, you know, it's easy to desire that office. It's easy to see and say, hey, but are you willing to do what it takes? You know, maybe some of you guys who have helped me while I've been away, now you get a bit of a taste of, you know, you, you have to keep in mind, you know, right, what, what needs to happen and what needs to happen next. You can't just come and just enjoy now. That's, that's the sort of things that go through my mind. I'm always thinking about the, the next things to do. So, you know, are you faithful? Are you committed? Are you diligent? You know, you're seeking to grow in your character. You know, if you want to desire this, are you able to meet those qualifications to run your family? You know, do you have the desire to preach? Right? If, if, you want, if you desire the office of a bishop, I give you the opportunity to preach and I have to like chase you up for it. 
that, then, then you know, are you able to actually get to that point you know, and, and desire it? Desire the office of a bishop. So that's church, family. So we touch a bit on marriage. You know, people look at other people's marriages and they say, you know, you want... You know, people will look at my... I, I, I honestly think I have a great marriage. I, I love my marriage. It's awesome. <laughs> Elizabeth knows it too. We talk about it all the time. But, uh, and I don't just think it's just because we, we, we're anything special. It's because we've tried to implement just open, honest communication in our marriage. You know, and, and like I said, you know, it's building friendships. Building a marriage is the same thing. You need to be able to openly and honestly communicate with one another. And, and as you talk, you, know, you, you need to respond the right way as well. So it's not just how you communicate. Because you can say, oh, open, honest communication. Just tell it like it is. Right? So it's how you communicate. But it's also when somebody communicates to you, how you receive what they're saying to you. Right? And if you can have the right mindset in the communication in your marriage, then you can build that strong marriage. So, you, so it's easy to desire a good marriage. Right? You can say, hey, I really want to have a good marriage. I want to have you know, the sort of marriage that I see other Christians enjoying. And the question is, are you able to do that? It starts with you. Because right? you might say, well, my wife doesn't communicate properly. My husband doesn't communicate properly. Well, it starts with you. Right? Are you able to communicate properly, to encourage your wife to communicate that way. You know, spending time on your marriage, you know, transparent communication. One thing I think is really important and just goes, flies in the face of our flesh, is just early, early conflict resolution. I always think of conflict in my marriage like dirty dishes, right? Like, if, if, you, if you know what I mean by dirty dishes, like if you leave, the longer you leave them in the sink, the harder they are to clean because right, the, the dirt starts getting all crusty and something that would have just washed off with water is now like solidified onto that plate. You need to get the steel wool out and, and you know, more work to clean it up. So I think, I think like of marriage that way. Like when I have a conflict with Elizabeth and I'm sort of procrastinating whether to resolve it, I just think it's going to be easier to do it now than do it later. I just got to humble myself and just face it and just bring it up and just deal with it. And sometimes, you know, Elizabeth can probably tell you, sometimes it's awkward because she knows I'm like coming to her with my tail between my legs. But, you know, then, then we, we can resolve. At least it's like it's done, you know, rather than it festering and getting harder to, to, to resolve a bit later. So think about that, you know, so you want that good marriage. Are you, are you willing to do these things? Because when something is small in your marriage, when a conflict is small, it's easy to just sort of brush it off. Do you know what I mean? But the problem is in a marriage, these small things, they build up. They build up. And that's why when couples break up, they divorce. It's, it's, something, it's over something so petty. But it's petty because it's just been building up over time. All these little things have been built. And why? Because the couple have not been open and honest with one another. When something came up, they were able to gracefully say, hey, you know, you did this and it kind of upset me. Or I, you know, I did this and I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. You know? And if you just do that quickly and at the beginning, it just saves you a lot of heartache because there's things that aren't bottling up and then you'll have a, a, a much better marriage. And obviously there's other tips I could give you as well, but that's just one I'm just sharing now. So put in some time in your marriage, spend time together, you know, be transparent and just think about how you respond to one another, how you talk and how you receive, you know, how, how you, you know, sometimes in, in my marriage, like I know Elizabeth's sometimes been bottling some things up. Um, I hope you don't mind sharing this, but sometimes she'll be like bottling things up. And then there'll be a time when she's like, she needs to talk to me, right? And I know this is like, okay, she's, she's got to the point where she's willing to share some things with me. So I, I in my mind, because this has happened several times over my marriage, right? So in my mind, I sort of think, okay, this, this is a time where Elizabeth, because I know she struggles with this. So she's gotten to a point where she's willing to share with me. Now, do I, does she share something with me? And I'm just thinking, oh, how dare you think this? You know, you say, you know, how you think this, you don't think this of me, all, all this sort of... I could have that attitude. Or I could think, all right, my wife has gotten to the point where she's going to share something very sensitive with me. I want her to continue to share sensitive things with me. So when I know she's about to share something with me, I'm getting into the mindset of, okay, how, how, how am I going to best respond to this so that in future she still wants to keep sharing with me? She's comfortable to do that. So... These are the sort of things I think about in my marriage where, and I'm not perfect. Obviously, I'm telling you all the good points right now, so I'm not, I'm not perfect. So I'm, I'm just sharing you some tips that you can keep in mind so that you know, when, you, when you deal in your marriage, it, it, it can help. 
So same with children. You know, you may look at somebody else's children and say, you know, I wish my children behaved like that. Or my children were able to do that. Or my children didn't act like this. Well, are you able to do what it takes to, to discipline your children? You know, because oftentimes I find in a lot of families and I see people tend to make excuses for their kids. You know, and there's always an excuse for your kids playing up. They're tired, they wanted this, or they fought with them, or they're hungry. You know, but is, is, that, is, that, is that a reason? Is, is that okay? If you're hungry and you're tired, is it okay if you like to throw a temper tantrum on the floor? No, right? You think, well, if I'm tired or if I'm hungry, I need to learn to deal with that. That doesn't give me an excuse to just throw a tantrum. It's the same with your children. Now, obviously, there's a bit more grace with your children. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes with my kids, I've been like dragging them all over Perth all day, right? And if they're a little angry at night, you know, that's kind of my fault. But if they're just a little bit hungry and then they're upset, you know, I check that in the sense that I do give them a spanking for that and tell them, hey, just because you're hungry, that doesn't give you an excuse to behave this way. Whereas it's easier to just let it slide, isn't it? You know, like when your children's playing up, you let it slide or you give them what they want and it's like, oh, you just make an excuse for them. But if you're able, are you able to just do what it takes, just discipline them at that time and just be consistent, you'll see that your children will learn that that's unacceptable behavior. And then they just don't even try anymore. They don't, well, it's not that they never try, but they'll, they'll try less. So it's not that you completely remove naughtiness from your kids, but I feel like disciplining them consistently just limits how bad they get. You know, put a limit on that. And the last couple of ones real quick is just, you know, work. You know, this is, this is more just success in business and job. People are often sometimes envious at the boss at work, or they're envious when somebody else gets a promotion, or they're envious at somebody else's business being successful. But are you able to do what it takes to have that same success, right? You know, if you want your business to be successful, you know, sometimes we look at people that have riches, or people that have a lot of money, and we think, oh, you know, it must be nice, but you don't know the work that they've put in, the sacrifices they've put in, the risks that they've taken, the time that they've taken to educate themselves. You know, maybe somebody was promoted over you at work and you get bitter, but, you know, they, you had the same opportunity as them. You know, in terms of you could have, uh, you know, learnt what they learnt and presented yourself. So all these sorts of things, you know, it's easy to want something. But the question is, are you able and are you willing to put in the extra time, you know, to drive yourself? You know, when you get home, what's the difference sometimes between successful people and unsuccessful people? Unsuccessful people, you know, that just sort of cruise through life, when they get home, they sit down and take the easy chair, right? Turn on the TV, sit in, oh, hard day's work, sit down and, and just watch TV and just relax. That's not how successful people operate. Successful people operate when they get home, they say, I've got this time, I better use this time to do something productive. So that's where they, you know, they'll get home, they might study up something, or they may do, so, do a business on the side, or they may learn something, rather than just wasting time, you know, watching videos, watching TV. So easy, like I said, to desire things, hard to actually do it. Are you able? So it's about setting your expectations right. If you're, not, if you're not willing to do what it takes to get there, then you can't be disappointed when you're not there. You know what I mean? Um, and the last one is uh, health. You know, just maybe just um, talking about losing weight. You know, this applies to men and women. You know, men and women want to maybe lose weight and be healthier. But are you able to do what it takes? Are you willing to, you know, you know if you're struggling with what you eat, you know, are you willing to journal your food? You know, journal what you eat. Sometimes uh, we, I always learned when it came to dieting um, and, and, and taking care of your health, if you couldn't control what you eat, like with your money, start recording what you eat. So then there's a bit of uh, accountability in your own mind, a bit of consciousness of what you're actually putting in your mouth as you write these things down. You know, set an exercise routine, be disciplined in it. So again, like I said, it's easy to desire something, but are you able to actually do what it takes to reach that goal, to reach that level of success that you're trying to reach. Anyway, so just a, just, just a, that's all I wanted to preach on today, just a lesson on, you know, easy, it's easy to want something, right? But encouraging you to actually do something about it, not just in your work, not just in your, your family, but also in your service to God as well. You know, you may be spiritually discontent with where you are, but it takes work. Right? It takes work to study, to practice, 
to learn, to, to, to not waste time. You know, if you're wasting time rather than reading your Bible, you know, being consistent with your soul winning and all that sort of stuff. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. We just pray that you'll just help us, Lord. We, we you, know, you know, I'm not preaching from a place of being perfect either. I need this sermon just as much as anyone else. So thanks for the reminder, Lord, from your word that we often ask for things that are easier said than done. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to, to go through and, and do what we need to do in order to, to reach the levels that we can, that we're capable of, and to reach our full potential, and not just in our physical life, but in our spiritual life. So help us, Lord, help us to always remember to have the right attitude when we come to you. And we just thank you, Lord, that you're a God of grace, and that even if we are not perfect, uh, we have ups and downs in our spiritual life that we can we have grace from you lord to, to continue to do uh, what we need to do so thank you lord for your love and we pray all these things in jesus name amen